In challenging times such as these, with inflation breaking records and cost of living escalating, how do we survive, let alone thrive? Yet survive and thrive we must, but not by wishful thinking or transient hope. It's going to be by the wisdom and favour of God, employed with financial intelligence. Every Wednesday this month, it is all about money matters, because money matters matter. This is essential practical teaching to see you prosper against all odds. So, join us every Wednesday from 7.25pm on any of our digital platforms at HOTR London. Don't be late and invite others to join us too. God bless you. Good evening, House on Rock London. My name is Shogun Lanyan, and I'm really glad you could make it to this live class on a Wednesday. Now, throughout this new month, Pastor Timmy will be bringing you well-needed week-by-week teachings on the serious topic of money matters. Now, these teachings will help you survive during the upcoming economic crisis and transform your life survival skills. So get ready to get an incredible understanding of financial prosperity and don't forget to bring a friend along too. But before we commence on this teaching, it's time to worship the Lord. So let's join Sister Ellen and Grace L from our worship team to lift up the King of Kings. Father, we give you glory. We exalt you. We say you have won the victory and now you are seated on the right hand of God. In glory and power, you reign in sovereignty and we honor you this evening, this morning, this afternoon.
is risen. He sits on high. He has won every single victory. And he reigns on high. Just so you know, our God, he's risen. And he sits on high. He has won it all. And he reigns on high. One more time, our God, he's risen. He sits on high. He has won every single victory. He reigns on high. Our God, he is risen. He sits on high. He's won the victory for you and I. And he reigns forevermore. Forever, 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 forever. Forever. Thank you, Jesus. That you reign. That you're seated on high. We love you, Jesus. Good evening, brethren. Welcome to another life class on a Wednesday and the first life class in the month of September. You are in for a great ride, a great time tonight. God is going to bless you indeed. But I don't want you to enjoy it just by yourself. I want you to be an ambassador tonight and go out of your way and invite everyone you know to join us right now. This is not a class that they can afford to miss. So go ahead, invite, invite, invite right now. Invite people, send out text messages, send out WhatsApp messages to all your friends, to all your contacts to come and join us right now. And if you happen to be on Facebook, share the feed so that all your contacts will know that we are live and direct and hopefully they will come and join us too. It's going to be a great life class tonight. We had a great time on Sunday in the Sunday service. Looking forward to next week, Sunday also. But the series in the midweek services this, this month, they're going to be powerful indeed. It's a new life class series. I'm excited about what God wants to say through me. We're dealing with money matters because money matters, they matter. <laughs> it's going to be phenomenal. It's going to be great. I think it's supremely relevant that we're dealing with this subject at this time because all of us are well conscious of the cost of living crisis, the elevations, the inflation, scarcity, and all of these things. And so there's quite a bit of anxiety, concern, and I dare say even fear out there. And this is a time where we really need to learn how to manage our money the way that God would have us manage our money. This night's teaching is going to serve as a foundation laying teaching, but it's going to also set us up for great things to follow. I'm giving you a little bit of a sneak preview of how this teaching is going to go on through this month because I think it's important that you don't miss even one of the classes because they're going to be powerful indeed. It's going to be line upon line, precept upon precept. We'll start from what some people might consider theological, but we're going to move from the theological into the practical. Before this series is done, we'll have some financial experts come in to give us the best advice on how to navigate these challenging financial times. So you really don't want to miss it and you want to tell all of your friends, your neighbors, your contacts to join us too because they too need financial freedom, liberty. They too know, need to know how to manage their money because if they are in crisis, they pull you in also because you have to throw out a lifeline to them. But if all of us learn how to maximize what God gives us, guess what? We'll be good together. Amen and amen. All right. Our text for, for tonight is taken from the book of Matthew and chapter 6 and verse 24. Have you invited people? Go ahead. This is the last moment. Get them in, get them in, get them in. Invite now, now, now. We're going right into God's word. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. This is what it says. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let me read that to you just one more time. 
No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This conversation and this text is actually about mastery. It's about mastery. You cannot serve two masters. We've already come to understand over the last number of months that freedom is not the absence of boundaries or servitude. True freedom is expressed within godly boundaries. In fact, outside of godly boundaries, what is there is bondage. True freedom is expressed in your ability to choose your own servitude. But on the issue of service, you will serve something or the other. Paul makes this argument further in the book of Romans chapter 6 where he says, To whomever you yield your members to serve, that is your master, whether to sin or to righteousness. This conversation is about mastery. This conversation is about mastery. Who will you submit to? Who will be your master? You cannot have two masters. At some point, if you have two masters, there will be a clash. You can't serve God and mammon. What is intriguing in this text, in this pilot text, is that uh, money or mammon is pitted against God as an opponent to God. Almost as if the only thing that can really contest with God in the hearts of men is mammon. It's suggesting that the most common contestant to the throne of our heart, for, for the throne of our hearts, is mammon particularly in these last days. Who is or what is mammon? Of course, the, in, in, this is a script, a, a, a word that comes from the Chaldeans, the ceramic or Aramic, which, is for, which means wealth and riches. Uh, but the question should, be, should, should rise, that why was it not simply tr translated as wealth and riches in the New King James translation of God's word? Because man, mammon is more than just the wealth and the riches. It's also talking about the God of wealth and riches. It's talking about a spirit. A sp there's a spirit behind mammon. And the spirit of mammon is well in operation in the day uh, that we are living in. There's a spirit behind the scenes. Listen to this. There's a spirit behind the scenes that uses the opportunity of the love of money and the power that money affords you to ascend the throne of men's hearts. Okay, so this spirit actually hides behind money, it hides behind money and, and then uses the love of money. If, if you have the love of money, you will use the love of money and the power that money gives you as its own avenue to ascend the throne of your heart if you don't master it. This conversation is about mastery. It's not saying that money is inherent, inherently evil, but when money becomes the master of your heart, that is evil. When money becomes the master of your heart, that is evil. You see, money is a great servant, but a terrible master. Money was not designed by God for mastery. It was designed by God as a tool to serve you. Money is a great servant, but a terrible master. You must not allow money to master you, but rather you must master money. You must not allow money to master you, but you must master money. Don't let money subjugate you. You bring money into subjugation. You cannot serve God and money, but you must serve God with money. The simple subject of my teaching, this foundation day in teaching tonight is God and money. God and money. Mighty Father, I ask that you help me in these next number of minutes, that you speak through me. You help me not to do any injustice to your word, but to rightly divide it. And that by reason of that accurate division of your word and the entrance of truth, there will be light, illumination, leading us to new levels of experience with you. May the power of the God of money or mammon be broken up over our lives in the name of Jesus. And may we gain mastery over money. Thank you, Lord. 
in Jesus' mighty name, we do pray. And the people said, Amen. Type Amen in whatever feed that you have access to right now. God and money. That's what we're dealing with tonight. It's foundation lane. It's going to be biblical. It's going to be theological. But trust me, it's very essential. We live in a day and age where too many believers don't even want to endure sound doctrine. That is sound teaching. They simply want the end. They don't want the means to the end. They want you to just deliver the what without delivering to them the how. And what that does is that creates a culture of dependency. Because if all I do is give you the what and I never give you the how, you're going to continue to come back to me for the what. But as a teacher of God's word, as one that wants to give you sound doctrine, I deliver to you the how. But you have to be able to endure sound doctrine, good teaching, even when sometimes it doesn't seem to be exciting. So I'm deliberately laying this foundation theologically, biblically, scripturally. And upon this foundation, we will build and we will get to where God wants us to get to. Trust me, before this series is done, we're going to get really practical practical about money matters. It is often said that money is the root of all evil. It is often said, many people say it, bandy it around. Even people that aren't Christians say it, the money is the root of all evil. But this is not what the scriptures say. The scripture that people are often quoting from is the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, for the love of of money is the root of all kinds of evil. This is New King, New King James translation. For, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Did you get it? It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It did not say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It said that the love of money, there's a difference. There's a difference between love and the between the love of money and money itself. And it's telling you that the root of all kinds of evil is, uh, is the love of money. Now, in the original King James translation, it puts it this way. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say all kinds of evil. It simply says all evil. And when you read it in that King James translation, you can start to wonder that, uh, is, is he saying that all evil comes out of the love of money? Uh, I know many evils that have no association whatsoever to do with the love of money. It's not saying that. What it is saying is that one of the roots, one of the roots to all evil is the love of money. If you want to see it this way, you could see like a plant that has many roots, all right? So all evil is the plant, but then you have many roots. And one of the major roots uh, to uh, all kinds of evil or all evil is the love of money. But more accurately translated in other um, uh, translations of God's word, what it says is that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That means there are all sorts of different types of evil that come out of the love of money. The love of money is not the source of all evil. It is just one of the roots to all kinds of evil. It is the love of money that is the root of, to all kinds of evil and not money itself. Money itself is actually, it's, 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 it's neutral. It is, it's neither good nor bad. It's neither evil nor, nor righteous. Money is just neutral. Money adapts to whoever is holding it. Money takes on the nature of the holder. Money in the hands, therefore, of a good man is good money. While money in the hands of an evil man is evil money. Money simply takes on the nature of the owner, the nature of the holder. Can I go deeper? Money exposes and amplifies the character of the holder, the nature of the holder. Money will expose what's really in your heart. And it will amplify your nature. Money exposes and amplifies the nature of the holder. If you really want to know who a man is, how a man is, you could give him some money. Give him good money. And you start to see that he would display 
who he really is, what's really in his heart. The more money, money you give a man, the more his true pro proclivities will be exposed and amplified. It's not money that is evil. It's actually the man that is evil. Money is only exposing the evilness in him. He's exposing his proclivities. Uh, all right? So money is not evil or good. It's the man that is holding it that's either evil or good. All right? Did you get that? The problem is not money in itself. It's our relationship with money. Your relationship with money. What's your relationship with money? Are you in love with it? That's the love of money. All right. You see, whatever you love, you are going to pursue and you are going to prioritize. So when money is your love, you will pursue and prioritize its acquisition above all other things. You'll be willing to compromise and give all sorts of things away even your, your own morality, just for the sake of acquiring money because you are consumed with the love of money. It's your pursuit. It's your priority. And that's how the scripture talks about you becoming pierced with all sorts of sorrows. You'll be willing to pay prices you should not pay simply to be able to have money. Those that harbor the love of money stray. This is what the scripture said. It says they stray from their faith. They stray away from the faith in their greediness and are pierced with many sorrows. When we look at this scripture, look at that text closely. Let's look at it closely. It says that they stray away from the faith. If you harbor the love of money inside your, your heart, it's just a matter of time. That love will, will cause you to stray away from the faith. And listen to what it now says. It says, in their greediness. It introduces the concept of greediness here, which we don't often have many pastors or preachers teaching or talking about. And yet we need to. Because listen to this. Greediness is fertile ground for the love of money. Greediness and the love of money are closely linked together. Greediness is fertile ground for the love of money. What is greediness? Greediness is, is, is having or showing an intense and selfish desire for something. Showing an intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth and power. It is associated with excess having more than you need, having a, a super abundance of what you, you need. One of the uh, prime, prime, prime ministerial um, candidates or, 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 or just, just this week, uh, part of the things that people felt they didn't like about him was simply because he's super rich. So they felt he, he has too much. Uh, I'm not saying he's greedy. I, I don't think that he got his wealth from um, illegitimate sources, but the scriptures is telling us that greediness is associated with wanting more than you need, wanting excess um, and for selfish ends. You can have much more than you need, but your intent for having much more than you need might not be for selfish ends, and that changes the whole equation. But when there's greediness there, there is selfishness. The desire, the, uh, greediness is the desire to always have more and to particularly have more than others. When somebody is greedy, they're not satisfied that they have a lot. They are always going to be looking around them to see who has more than me they, because they always want to have more than others. This is greed. It is the fertile ground for the love of money. Selfishness is at the heart of greed. It's always about self, all right? But we must understand that God is more interested in our character than he is in the type of car that we drive. <laughs> what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose 
his own soul. God is more interested in the salvation of your soul than your acquisition of all the things that are in the world. It is very easy, let me not lie to you, very easy for God to give us all things. In fact, he said that if he freely gave us his son, how will he not with him give us all things? So he's actually made all things available to us already through Christ Jesus. But he will never willingly give us all things at the expense of our souls. So I introduced this statement. I will repeat it again before we are done tonight. God has no problem with you having things. He has a problem with things having you. God has no problem with you having things. What he has a problem with is with things having you. He's more interested in your character than preoccupied with the type of car that you drive. Uh, we too need to prioritize character development in money matters above simply increasing how much money we have. Okay, can I take a sidestep and go a little bit deeper here? Stay with me, people. This, what I'm talking about right here, this is where we as preachers need to be careful and balanced in our prosperity preaching to not inadvertently be fanning the flames of greed, covetousness, and even corruption in the hearts of our hearers when we preach prosperity with no reference to godly character. When you preach prosperity with no reference whatsoever to the purpose of the prosperity, to godly character, we inadvertently start to fan the flames of greed, of selfishness, of covetousness, of even corruption in the hearts of men. And this we have seen on many grand scales where if the, a strong culture of discipleship, of godly character, of the purposes of the kingdom and is not emphasized, what happens is that with the preaching of prosperity, people are becoming even more greedy and more selfish and more self-centered. That, that devil is a liar. That's not your portion. That's not our portion in the name of Jesus. So I am, I am more interested in getting greed out of your heart before I get money into your hands. I am more interested in getting greed out of your heart before I get money into your hands. Greed out before money in. Did you get that? Greed out before money in. Hallelujah. With God, it's always fruits before gifts. God is interested in you bearing the fruit of the Spirit before he's interested in your giftedness. He wants you to have gifts and he wants you to have things, but he wants you to be fruitful and the fruit of the spirit particularly, which has to do with your character, okay? Coming back to this key point, it is not money that is evil, but the love of money. We need to purge ourselves, therefore, from the love of money. We need money, but we need to purge ourselves from the love of money, okay? Now, in the book of Ecclesiastics, I read from Ecclesiastics chapter 10 and verse 19. Listen to what it says. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. Money answers everything. Woo. Money answers everything, you see. Money is so common. We encounter money every day, all the time. Money is part of the fabric of society, fa fabric of the life that, that we live. And this scripture says that money answers all things. Money has an answer for everything. In fact, money is talkative. <laughs> it's very talkative. Any situation, any circumstance, money has an answer, has something to say. But even though money answers all things, even though money has an answer for everything, its answers are not always right. His answers are not always right. I've seen couples that are having clashes and they're, they're fighting. And, and, and the man feels that the solution to all of their uh, divisions and strife and fight, fighting is money. And, and, and it, so, so whenever they have a fight, he simply goes into his bank account and 
buys an expensive gift and and uh, buys an expensive car, or buys something lavish, or pays for a holiday um, just to to make peace, so to say. And and I know that there are a lot of ladies possibly that are here and say, I wouldn't mind that kind of man <laughs> who buys me an expensive this, that, and the other whenever we have an argument. But the funny thing about it is that all of that is short-lived. It's not the right answer. The right answer is finding out what is the root of our strife. And let's deal with that issue. Let's not paper over it or paint over it simply with money. The answer that money is given in that situation is not the right answer. It is good to still buy things for your wife. You better do so, good husband, man. You better find ways of making her happy. But you've got to realize that the answer is not always money. Often the peace that money gives is temporal. It is humorously said that money cannot make you happy. And somebody answered, well, that, that, the person that said that doesn't know where to shop. <laughs> There's something called retail therapy where you go to the right shops and you have enough money to buy whatever it is you want to buy. You will feel good. But guess what? Happiness is not joy and happiness is transient. It's dependent on happenings. Once the time span of that happening has expired, you're back to the reality of whatever your situation is. Money is essential to life. So we need to be careful that we are not just vilifying the concept of money. And conservative Christianity tends to try to make money seem to be the evildoer. It's not the evildoer. The scripture didn't say money is the root of all evil. It said the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is essential for life. You need money. I need money. We need money. The truth be told, nothing is really free in this world. Someone paid for it. Even your salvation isn't free. Jesus paid for it. There is nothing that is free. There's, it's always paid for, maybe not by you, but by somebody else. You see, there's a transaction behind everything you see. There is a transaction behind everything you see. That TV, there's a transaction behind it that put it where you are looking at it right now. The phone you are holding in your hand, there's a transaction behind it that put it in your hand. Everything you see is backed up by a transaction that often involves money. So money is essential to life. It is common in life. Now listen to me. If you have to choose between having or not having money, what would you choose? If you have to choose between having and not having money, what would you choose? It's a no-brainer, right? Better to have it than not to, ha not to have it as long as it doesn't have you. It is better to have money and than not to have money as long as the money does not have you. You've got to be the owner in the equation. Even in the kingdom of God, the, the, the kingdom of God on the earth needs money. Oh, <laughs> somebody said blasphemy. No, it's not blasphemy. The kingdom of God, the church of God, house on the rock of London, churches all over this world, we need money to do what we do. In the book of Zechariah, let me give you scripture for it. Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 17, he says, Again proclaim, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord again comforts Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. What did he say? He said that his cities will be spread abroad, will be spread out, will expand and go into other places through the vehicle of prosperity. Listen, we need money to do what we do. I've said before, I've heard other preachers say, it, anointing without money is annoyance. You're full of all sorts of anointing and gifts and insight. But if there's no money to fuel its publication, to fuel its spread, to fuel its promotion, you become annoyed that you've got all this, but you don't have any avenue to get it out there for people to be blessed by it. It takes prosperity. It takes money to advance the kingdom of God on the earth. House on the Rock, 
to put on the lights, it takes money. For, for us to have this message that you are hearing tonight, it took money. There was a transaction behind it that made it possible for, the, for, for it to be done and for you to be able to receive it uh, tonight. And you see, a lot of the time, people come into church and they're assuming everything here is somehow free. But meanwhile, in your own home, there's nothing that is free. You know it. Your power, <laughs> the lights. Right now, a lot of people are, are, are really reprimanding their children. Put off the light. When you are out of there, you put off the light. Don't, it's daytime. You don't need the lights on. Put it off. <laughs> you know, because we know that all of these things cost money. And it's exactly the same thing in the house of God. It takes money. We need money. You need money. I need money. We need money. Okay, but this legitimate need for money must not compromise our heart. It must not corrupt our heart and cause us to compromise. It's legitimate. I, my, my need for money is as legitimate as your need for money. But what God is saying is I don't need you allowing the, the legitimacy of your need for money cause you to be corrupted and to start to compromise your values. We still need to guard our hearts with all diligence to make sure that the love of money does not enter, to make sure that the love of God is king in our hearts. So how do I tame, listen to me, how do I tame this legitimate need for money that I have and guard against it leading me into the love of money? So it's about mastery. This brings us back to our pilot text in, the, in this foundation laying um, teaching. It's about who you consciously choose to be your master, God or money. Who you consciously identify as your source, God or money. Who you consciously earmark as the sustenance of your life, God or money. You cannot serve God and money. The only true source of everything is God. Everything else is a resource. The only true source of everything is God. Everything else is a resource. And you need to be careful that you are never seduced by the resource to make the resource your source, your God. When God is the source, oh, I don't know whether you hear me, what I'm saying. This is, this is, this is key right there. You, that you cannot serve God and money. You've got to make sure that God remains identified, uh, recognized by you as this is my source. Everything else is a resource. Uh, because when you make something that is a resource become the primary source, then our jealous God will need to shut down that resource so that you realize that your real source was never the resource, but was also him, was always him, the source. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot make both of them your primary source. God must be the primary, but you must serve God with money. Why? Money is... is constantly in your hands, constantly in the world. It's all over the place. If you do not use money to serve God, then I'm going to question whether you're serving God. You must serve God with your money. But in order to serve God with money, you have to master money. In order to serve God with money, you have to master money. It's all about money mastery. Master money, don't let money master you. Master money, don't let money master you. At the heart of it, we're going deep and we're coming to the, to, to the close of this foundation laying teaching. At the heart of it, it's actually about stewardship. It's about stewardship. You know, the, the verse that we read at the beginning, Luke gives us another account of this same verse. The contention between the two masters of God and money. And he puts it in the context of stewardship because it is ultimately about stewardship. So when Luke is talking about this, we read about it in the book of Luke chapter 16 from verse 10 to verse 13. Stay with me. Let's read it together. It says, he who is faithful in what is least 
is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, to, to your trust, the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So now you see verse 13 is the verse we read um, earlier, but you can now see that is the context of talking about stewardship. He's talking about stewardship. He who is faithful in, in what is least will be faithful in much. He who is unjust in what is least will be unjust in much. He who is faithful in unrighteous manner, who is not faithful in unrighteous manner, who will give him the, the mammon, who will give him give to his trust true riches. And if you have not been faithful in another man's um, goods, who will give you your own, you see? So you've got to know who your master is. Who's your master? Who's your master? Who's your master? Who is your master? Are you your own master? That, good, right? It's good to be your own master, to master yourself. Good. But better than that is to realize that God is your master. And therefore, you are but a steward of whatever he gives you. If God is my master, whatever I have, whatever is given to me, is actually makes me a steward of whatever is given to me. And what is required from a steward? What is required from a steward is faithfulness in what has been given to him to steward. What is required of a steward is faithfulness in what is given to him. So whatever God puts in your hand, finances, resources, material, whatever he gives you as a steward of your master God, what is required of you is to be faithful in that thing. Oh God, I hope you get it. We need to shift, therefore, from an ownership mentality to a stewardship mentality. Part of our problem with money and having a lot of it or not having a lot of it and all of that is because in our mind, we are still thinking of it as mine, 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 mine. Meanwhile, from God's perspective, no. The silver and gold are mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I put it in your hand, it's still mine. Your job is that you are meant to be steward of it. All I have, all I am was given to me. And what he requires of me is my faithful stewardship of what he has given me. The text here, the, the one in Luke now, it's actually talking about God and mammon, God and money, all right? So when we now understand that the two subjects in the text is God and money, you can now look at the earlier part of the text when it says that, when it says that, he who is faithful in what is least will also be faithful in much. Now, if the two subjects are God and money, what is least between God and money? Money, obviously. Okay. So money is the least. So now when you put money in for the least in that verse, it's saying that he who is faithful in what is least, money, he who is faithful in money, will also be faithful in much. Oh my, think about it. <laughs> who, he who is unjust in what is least money, he who is unjust, unbalanced, does not master money, will also be unjust in much. Think about it. Let it marinate I mean, in, deep inside you. Because I, I, there's deep truths right in here when you really, really think about it. You see, if you cannot tithe on a hundred pounds, you are not going to be able to tithe on 10,000 pounds. Some people say, oh, when I have more money, I will give more. As well intended as that is, if you have not developed a character and a culture of giving, even when you did not have much, you are not going to be faithful when you do have much. That's what that scripture is saying. He that is faithful in the least, in, and the least thing here is money, is not going to be able to translate that. The, the, the unfaithfulness will not suddenly become faithfulness now that he's dealing with something that is more weighty. 
Are you hearing me what I'm saying? If you are not going to be disciplined and faithful in what is inconsequential, money, what is least, uh, material things, you are not suddenly going to become super faithful when you are dealing with more weighty and heavy things. Oh, I really hope that you get this. I've seen people that are not faithful on the job that is not theirs. They're cutting corners. They're doing all sorts of things. They're not faithful there. And in their psyche, it's because it's not mine. I don't really care. And they think that now when I get my own dream job or my own dream business, all of a sudden I'm going to be super faithful and effective. And they might seem to be so at the beginning of the new business or the dream job. But the truth be told, there has been a culture, a character of unfaithfulness that they have exhibited for maybe weeks, months, dare say years in what was not theirs that will still end up showing up in what is now theirs that will undermine what is theirs. Are you getting the point here? So it's about stewardship. It's about your faithfulness. It's about your discipline. The text says that if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, so my goodness, it's telling me mammon is money. It's telling me that if I'm not faithful in managing money, if I'm not faithful in mastering money, then who will commit into my hands true riches? Because the same unfaithfulness that I have in mastering money will still show up in how I manage the more weightier things. This suggests that your mastery of money, your faithfulness in how you utilize and maximize money is connected to how you handle true riches. You have to think about that one because I know it's going against natural religious uh, thought, but this is scripture. Do you get it? You've got to master money and be faithful in how you utilize and maximize money because it does reflect on how you are going to handle the weightier things of righteousness. Woo! Glory to God. Get it? Now, now you're okay, so... so I, I cannot uh, 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 l love God, I cannot love God and money at the same time. I must love God. I must, m God must be my master and not money. Um, I cannot serve God and money. I got to serve God, but I've got to serve God with money. The, 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 the question then arises that how do I practically, pastor help me, how do I practically put God above money in my heart always? How do I practically put God above money in my heart always? I'm going to take a side step and quickly give you a tip bit here. Before this series is done, we're going to get real practical, you know. You encounter money decisions every day. Every one of us, every day we encounter money decisions, whether to eat this or eat that, whether to buy that or, or buy this, whether to take the train or take the car, um, whether to with money decisions every day. One of the things to help you is you've got to have made the decisions in advance. If you've made a whole lot of money decisions in advance, then it doesn't become a task every time you encounter a money decision to start saying, okay, so what am I going to choose? Because you've already decided these are the decision, this is the decision I've made as regards what I do here, what I do there. So having personal money rules that you stick to is part of what is going to relieve you of the fatigue of the constant money decisions that you face every day. But let's go back to scripture and let's see what the scripture says about the practicality of putting God above money. In the book of Matthew and chapter 6 verse 31 to 33, it says, Therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For, all, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Hallelujah. This scripture is giving us 
some practical insights to how to keep God first, how to keep God above money in our hearts. And it's about priority. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When you put God first and his righteousness, then God will cause all these other things to be added unto you. He's telling you that part of the practical way to put God first, to put God above money in your heart, to not allow the love of money seep into your heart, is that God's priorities become your priorities. What God wants becomes your first consideration. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added into you. And as I was studying on this, God just gave me new insight and revelation. He said that there's a biblical example of this, and the biblical example of this is actually Solomon. When Solomon became the king of Israel, he asked God for wisdom and understanding to lead the people of God right. And that was God's primary concern. That was prim God's primary kingdom. That was called God's primary righteousness. The, the preservation of Israel ultimately for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. And because Solomon prioritized this, asking God, not for wealth, not for riches, not for cattle, not for mansions, not for all of those things, but that God would give him wisdom and understanding to lead the people of Israel. God said, you good man, you've put first my kingdom and my righteousness. I'm going to add all other things unto you. Everything you did not ask for, I'm adding it to you. Whenever you put the kingdom of God first, his priorities first, his concerns first, God will make sure that everything else is added unto you. And as I looked at it closely, it started to show me that what I should seek first is the wisdom of the kingdom. I should seek first the wisdom of God in all things, and then all other things will be added unto me. Ask first, what does God want me to do? <laughs> that, is, that, 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 that is the practical way you keep the love of money out of your heart and you keep God enthroned in your heart. You get a sudden influx of, of, of finance you did not expect, you did not anticipate. You stop not to immediately start buying things for yourself. You get to do that. But your first request or posture is, God, what do you want me to do? I'm your steward here. How do you want me to use these resources that you have brought into my life? This is why, now listen to me, this is why tithing is so powerful. I know there's been so much huge debate on to tithe or not to tithe and all of this the, and the other. And I ain't getting into that in this night's class. Maybe we'll touch on it in the future classes. But understand the principle of tithe, tithing and how powerful it is because tithing is putting God first. You see, the, the principle of tithing was never really about the amount. It was never really about the amount. It was about what it symbolized. Why is tithe 10%? 10% represents the whole. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. When you go beyond 10, you're counting another 10. So when you take 10%, you've represented everything, okay? It was never really about the amount. It was about what it represented. It represents the prioritization of God and his kingdom. Oh, yakabusata. Tithing represents uh, the prioritization of God and his kingdom. It's about consciously putting God into your thought processes and your considerations. God should not be your last thought in your finances. It's supposed to be your first thought. To practically put God above money in your life, seek first the kingdom of God, his wisdom, his righteousness, in, and all other things including money, will be added to you. God is not opposed to you having things. He's opposed to things having you. If God was opposed to you having things, he would not be adding things to you. And my God wants to add things to you. Can I tell somebody that tonight? God wants to add. In fact, God has a storehouse of all sorts of goodies that he wants to add to your life once you get your priorities right. God wants you to have money. He's not, he's not opposed to you having money. He just doesn't want money to have you. He wants you to have money mastery. 
in times of lack and in times of abundance. Because this is the cycle of life. There will be times of lack and there will be times of abundance. But if you gained mastery over money, you will know how to navigate both the times of lack and the times of abundance. Paul said, I know how to abase and how to abound. He was acknowledging that there are cycles in life where there are abundance and there is cycle in life where there is seeming lack. I know how to handle whatever the season is. And we too must master money to know how to handle even a challenging financial season as is hitting the world right now. Joseph, the wisdom of Joseph, he says in the time of abundance, don't spend it all, save up. And when the time of lack comes, then you can use what you've saved up to survive the times of lack. The Bible is full of rich wisdom on how we navigate the times that we're living in. And this series is set to put you on the path to money mastery. Hallelujah. And that's why you don't want to miss a class. You don't want to miss a session of this teachings in this month of September because money matters matter. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I hope you've been blessed by tonight's teaching. I hope you got something significant. And this is a teaching I believe you're going to have to go back over again and you're going to take notes and you're going to think application, think application, think application. Don't think just knowing. Think how do does this apply to me and how do I apply it uh, in various situations and circumstances. It won't be great this month. Hallelujah. Well, let's prioritize the kingdom of God even right now in our givings. So if you want to give to support us and to partner with our work, um, the details are now on the screen. Please choose the pathway that is most preferred by you to give towards the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to pray upon every giver. As you give, God will cause increase to come your way not by a magical means, but by wisdom and direction, the knowledge of witty inventions and divine favor. As you give, God will cause men to give back unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. God wants you to prosper. He will make you prosper as you listen to his instructions and follow his lead. I pray blessings upon every giver tonight. Lord, bless them and bless their giving. Lord, cause mighty doors to open unto them and cause great resource to rush to their aid in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. It will be remiss of me not to give an opportunity to somebody out there that has not accepted Jesus Christ yet as Lord and Savior. You've heard what I've taught tonight. God is not against you. God is for you. God wants you blessed. God wants you prosperous. God wants you having more than enough. He just doesn't want those things to have you. So if you're ready to surrender your life to Christ Jesus, even tonight, please repeat these words of prayer after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I repent of my sin and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth. Therefore, by faith, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. If you pray that prayer with sincerity in your heart and with true faith, you are indeed born again. I want to help you to grow in the Lord, to mature from being a child of God to becoming a son of God. So please direct message us on any of our social media platforms or send us an email or call the number on the screen or follow the pathway that's on our website. And let's help you to get planted in the house of the Lord and growing from glory to glory and from height to height. Hallelujah. Let me invite you all in next week, Wednesday, as we go further next week, Wednesday. Next week, Wednesday, we start to go into the real mechanics of how money works in society today. Money and value. What's the interface between those two things? What's the priority be the, between those two things? It's going to be a bit of spiritual economic class, 
but it's going to bless you. And these are things that we must exercise ourselves in understanding in this day and age if we are to weather these seasons and come out on top on the other side. So don't miss next week Wednesday. And if you've been blessed by tonight's teaching, make sure you invite everybody else you know to join us next week Wednesday. God bless you real good. Let's close out tonight with by sharing the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely God's goodness and God's mercy shall follow you all the days of your life and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen and amen. God bless you. He came that we would not just have life, but have it more abundantly. He wishes above all things that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Prosperity is his plan for us. And this prosperity is not meant to be limited to an area or two. Total life prosperity is the name of the game. God wants you prospering spirit, soul and body. No area left untouched. Every Sunday this month, it's all about total life prosperity. Join us in person at the Rock Tower, 49 Tufnell Park Road, N7 OPS, from 10 a.m. for a spirit-filled worship and a life-changing word. And if for any reason you cannot come in person, make sure to join us online on all our digital platforms at HOTR London. Despite the indices of our times, we will yet prosper. Invite others to join us too. See you there. Don't be late. God bless you.